everyone, and welcome to FSM 6 Mobile, getting the most out of your solution. I am Christine Lavoy, a senior client account manager at IFS North America. And in today's session, um, we are going to talk about um, the FSM 6 mobile solution. And we're going to talk about um, how you can configure a solution to um, best utilize and build a solution for your team. The FSM mobile application automates your field service operations using a handheld device and provides the following benefits. The field service engineers have immediate access to customer information and scheduled work. The technician devices have real-time connectivity to enterprise applications. Transactional and synchronization data sends and receives time-sensitive data for critical activities. And store forward functions enable you to perform all your work regardless of your connectivity. In today's session, we're gonna talk about the key topics and we're gonna do a walkthrough of the FSM mobile solution and then in future sessions, if you look at the March schedule, you will see a session on configuring your mobile solution along with common troubleshooting issues and best practices for building your mobile implementation. The FSM mobile solution runs on Android devices, iOS devices, and Windows. Phones and tablets that allow Azure Active Directory. Now, this is an excellent time to talk about platform support and versions. So let's, so for those of you that have, do not belong to community, community is the best place to find what versions are supported in your application. But to find out if it's working, um, whatever, I'm running 5.7, update seven, what are my supported platforms? If you go to community, you will see that if you're logged in as a customer, right now you don't see the information, but if I go ahead and log in as an employee or a customer, you will see that you're going to get an additional box. And that box is gonna give you product release information. And under the product release information, if you go to FSM product updates, you will see all of the documentation for the application. And when you look at the installation guides, the installation guides will tell you where you can find your, what platforms are supported on every installation. So if you come here and you come down to the mobile section, we're gonna go through our device storage information and recommendations, bandwidth, networking, you'll see the mobile requirements. So every time you consider an update, you're looking for information on what platforms does this update run. If you go into the installation guide for either Azure or on-premise, under mobile requirements in the documents, you'll see the mobile requirements, the minimum information, and what's required to run iOS, Windows, and Android. You'll see in the note that support for Android is planned for FSM 6 update 8 but that 5.7 update six runs for Android six through 10. iOS for updates, FSM six update seven can run for iOS 10 through 14 and any PC or tablet that runs Windows 10 is supported. So this is the first thing as you start looking at mobile that you have to start paying attention to is that it's important to know what devices your device your application can run on now let's go back into the community for one other thing it's important to follow along on community to make sure that any relevant information that's been pushed out you're following and tracking so you'll see that last friday we put an announcement out about fsm because people were asking about android 11 support and you'll see there's a question and you'll see the impacts of it. So we try to make this type of information readily available to you, our customers. In 
If your field force needs to work in a disconnected state with access to their mobile work orders, customer information, contracts, warranty information, and product repair history, then the FSM mobile solution is the one you should implement. When implementing a mobile solution for your field force, it's important to look at the objectives you're trying to accomplish in implementing. It is key to remember that the more time you spend that you're, sorry, the more time your technician spends in the application capturing necessary data to run your business, the less time they're spending resolving your customers' issues. I've yet to meet a field technician that finds entering time or adding data the high point of their day. So to improve your customer and technician job satisfaction, it's important that the mobile solution allows easy, efficient capture of necessary data, but you don't want to trade off the quality of data on and the information necessary to have timely invoices and to reduce questions on why am I getting a bill for this. IFS has spent a great deal of time trying to build a tool which allows you to have the best of both worlds, an application that your technician finds easy to use and an application where you can get all of the relevant information that you're for your work that's being done so that you can improve your time to invoice and have accurate reporting of what's happening in the field. When you look at platforms, there's a couple things to look at. If you do not need connectivity, uh, disconnected state, and you have 100% connectivity, you may look at the technician portal. And there was an article in the, about the technician portal in the January newsletter. But if your technicians need the ability to work in a disconnected state, then mobile going forward with mobile is important. Your business is going to determine which platforms are supported early in the design process. It's common for a business to buy phones for its employees as it's much easier to support a single platform. Testing the solution is easier since it's only done on the chosen platform and it's easier to train the users for mobile solution rather than to train the help desk to support the staff. It's important to note though that if you do roll out more than one platform, the mobile solution on each device OS supports the functionality in a similar way, but there are differences in technology and best practices between the platforms and there are noticeable differences in the presentation and navigation. So if you're gonna run two or three platforms, there will be UI experience differences. When the configuration is complete, the solution will work across all of the platforms, but note that any code that you develop must exist in all platforms. So if you're right, choose to move forward with a customization and you write a customization for Android and you're wanting Windows or iOS also, you're going to need to write that same customization for iOS or Windows. For cross-platform support, we recommend configuration only as designer and um, client scripting will run cross-platform without additional development. I cannot encourage you enough to look at configuration only solutions. I get it, you want the best experience for your tech. They're not, they don't adapt to change well. You wanna give them exactly what they have right now. If you look at the solution and the workflows, make sure that you decide if the solution must be customized that there's cost benefit. In order to run the latest version of the application on a device, and if you're running a bring your own device scenario, you're going to have three sets of customizations with three sets of uplifts. Now let's talk about Android 11. Android 11 is coming out. You have to go to update eight because you need to issue a new device to somebody that's just joined the organization because you're growing or your contract is updating your devices every two years. Now you're in a position where you have to go to update eight if you're running three sets of customizations, you're gonna to have to pay to uplift all three sets of customizations to have that support for Android 8. IFS supports releases with updates periodically that fix known issues or add new feature set, including the mobile product. 
we want you to stay current on the latest updates that are released. Even to get fixes, you're going to have to pay to uplift customization. If you're registered with IFS support services, you'll receive notifications when the updates become available. Refer to your release notes for upgrade information that your organization has used. A client configuration only approach with designer, a client scripting and business rules for your solution. Merge in the patch code with your project if your solution involves customizations and code development and that will take it longer to get the solution to your mobile device, it'll increase your cost of ownership, and it takes you further away from your ultimate goal of evergreen software, which allows you to get the best total cost of ownership on your solution and the most for your support and maintenance dollar. If you insist on having customizations in your mobile solution, please reach out to myself or your account team about having your customizations covered under what we call enhancement support, so that you have a fixed known cost to uplift your enhancements when fixes come out or new features come out that you wanna take advantage of. Enhancement support gives you a component within your support fee that's incremental, but will keep your code current and give you the best chance at being able to easily take new updates. There's a couple common terms you're gonna hear when you're running mobile. The first of which is going to be the designer. When you log into mobile and you, your user ID is assigned a studio license, you are going to see some additional components in the menu structure related to mobile designer. Because everyone has similar business needs and they want to know how much time and cost are being spent on a job, they may have regulations which um, require capture of other key data and nuances, but almost everybody's business desire for workflows is the same with some slight variations. To support that business need, IFS has created the designer and configuration tools to modify the application. The mobile designer allows you to change the workflow a user follows based on a task type, allows you to change the fields and the order and what's required and not required. For more information about the mobile desi designer, there is an existing webcast that's back um, in the 5.7 set, or I'm doing a new updated mobile designer um, webinar in March. The next common configuration tool that you're gonna hear people talk about is scripting. Scripting is another powerful tool that allows you to change the mobile application without writing customizations or code. You can write and run scripts that change the results based on your field values. For more information about scripting, you can see the install manual. There is also a presentation on the webcast channel that goes through an introduction to client scripting. The documentation also includes some frequently used client script examples and client scripts can be used for complex um, configuration. Your goal should be that 99% of your solution is done in designer and the few anomalies that you can't get done, you do in client scripting. For example, you want to make fields visible, invisible, or set default values based on other values. You run a rebuild build list. So if it's this task type, the only available line codes are. It gives you the ability to have dynamic screen use cases presented to your technicians. And last but not least, the other way that you're going to configure and send information to your mobile device is synchronization rules. One of the biggest decisions you're going to make about your mobile implementation is what data on the device is and how often is it refreshed. Synchronization rules, often called sync rules, 
determine who will receive the data when FSM, when data is created in FSM, and the re relationships between the tasks and the supporting data. It's crucial in determining how efficient your system is going to be regarding the amount of data that's on the device. The more data you put on the device, the slower the device is going to take to initialize. If done well, synchronization rules are amazing. If poorly written or not thought out well, they're going to be the bane of your existence during go live and as your data keeps increasing in mobile future state. So think about your sync rules and what does your user really need? Sync rules perform the following functions. They identify which tables have their data synchronized to the device. So what data do you want on the device? They generate a database on the device, the tables and indexes. A table is created for each sync rule, regardless of whether the sync rule is for a table or a view. The table's metadata is used to create the key resolutions and triggers in the database. Sync rules determine how data is filtered before going to the device. Sync rules gather and send related data for transactions being sent to the device. They identify the MPM to be invoked when a table is updated and data is received from mobile. Extracts are automatically updated when rules are added or changed, and sync rules automatically check for XML. So let's look at an example. For example, to define which customer sites are available to your field engineer, FSC, or technician, whatever engineer, however you refer to them, on the device, you are going to build a place sync rule. In the place sync rule, you're defining a query that would deliver the places that your FSC services. It could be their service area. It could be their organizational service group. It could be the customers that they're associated with based on primary. You're going to build a sync rule for place that says, here's the place information I want on this device. Now you say, why don't I have all my places? They could go anywhere. In practicality, you are not going to want hundreds of thousands of place IDs on your system that your technician needs to sort through. You want to have enough information on the device for your tech to do their job well, but not so much information that they're overwhelmed. Similarly, you could build stock sync rule that gives your FSC a list of their personal service truck, or they could get a view of their team's service stock, or you could have them view all the stocking locations in their region. But there's no reason for them to see all the stock for your entire organization. Each sync rule manages to a single table or view and can be configured to push updates to the table as they occur in the application or based on a defined interval. Real-time syncs have more overhead. Um, so you may wanna look at how fast is that information changing? You can add, delete, or edit sync rules in your environment using the smart client on the mobile menu by choosing sync rules. Changes made to sync rules are immediately applied to your environment and then mobile will adhere to those sync rule changes. Next, let's talk about some basic concepts that running mobile you need to understand. Next, we're gonna talk through how mobile activation works, how mobile initialization works, what happens when you enter data on the mobile device, and what happens when you enter data in the smart client. Administrators and support personnel must understand the system data flow so they can perform the troubleshooting and provide help. The descriptions of the activation, initializations, and data transfer processes we're going to walk through. So let's start at first what happens during an activation. During an activation, the mobile application on the device sends an activation request. The mobile web service receives the message and passes along to the application server that message. The application server validates the credentials 
and enters the mobile device record for the user. The application server creates a database and places the mobile database in the directory defined by the application parameter that you've identified. The application server informs the mobile web service that the database is available. The mobile web service streams the database to its download directory. The mobile web service informs the device that the database is available. The device contacts the mobile web service using the download URL, which you've defined in your web config file of the mobile web service and downloads the database. The device will then unzip and attach the database to the SQLite engine that's running on any of your mobile devices. And then the device displays the home page indicating that the device has been activated. Once the device is activated, you need to initialize the data so that you have data on your device. Your initialization, your mobile application is going to send the initialization request and display the progress dialog on the device and display the sync messages in the sync viewer. The mobile service receives a message and passes it along to the application server. Application servers create a database and place it in the mobile database download directory defined by application parameters. The application server informs the mobile web service that the database is available. The mobile web service streams the database. The mobile web service informs the device that the database is available. The device contacts the mobile web service using the download URL, again, defined in the web config file. Again, you unzip the file, attach the database, and the device displays the home page now with all of the data on the device that's appropriate for that technician. I cannot tell you enough how many times I've talked to technicians whose solution is, oh, I got an error, I'm going to reinitialize my device. Yes, initializations will reset any errors your technician is seeing, but initializations will also throw away any work time reporting attachments, notes, descriptions that they've done as work on their device. Only use an initialization as a resolution to an issue your technician is hit if that's the only option that's available. Your techs are going to get really frustrated at you if you've not thought through your synchronizations, if you've not thought through how data is flowing through the system, if you've not thought through your workflows, they get initialization errors and they lose time. So what happens when data is entered on a device? As a user, I update my request or enter data on the mobile device. The mobile app creates a new row in the database on the device, messages are created with a status of ready and are sent to the mobile web service when the sync interval defined lapses. The mobile web service calls a perform on the application server to process the message and then the application server processes the message by executing the appropriate policy. Once the application server finishes processing the message, it now returns all of the results to the device the device sync issue requests to get mail from the server. The sync manager processes the results messages that it's retrieved from the server. The device updates the entity tables and processes the data that has happened. On the other side, when you're entering stuff on the smart client, if the user creates a new request and task for the user, adds a new value to a table that needs to go down. The audit extract is triggered for the table and processes the MPM that is used to process the message. The perform message checks for sync rules, i.e. is it a real-time sync rule or is there a scheduled interval? If it's a real-time sync rule and no direct owner is indicated, the sync rule ownership query is executed Anytime um, there is an insert 
or if the data on the table is related to task, then that um, related information on the query is ex executed. The update and any related data is placed in the outgoing message. The device syncs, the sync mechanism checks for outgoing messages and the device processes a new message and the data from the smart client ends up on the appropriate mobile device for availability. Now, what's important to understand there is that anything related to task is always going to go back and forth um, as a real-time sync rule. Anything else you identify as a real-time sync rule will go back and forth. The um, more real-time sync rules you have, the slower the device will appear to your technician. It's all about balance and thinking about your design. So let's go through a walkthrough of FSM Mobile. I am currently running the application in um, an emulation mode of a Surface tablet. As I mentioned, you could be running this in iOS or Windows. I just find from a showing people, this is the easiest display view. So what I'm going to do as a technician is I'm gonna log in with my user ID and password. And I come to the base screen of mobile. I am running a non-configured mobile solution. So this is standard out of the box colors. Most of you will build custom themes that have your own logos, your own colors. Um, but this is a good way to look at the general information related to what a tech sees in the mobile device. So first, let's start at the bottom. The bottom provides important information or notifications relative to your tech and change every time you log in. In this case, I see I've been assigned four new jobs. I have seven overdue jobs and I have two stock counts that I need to perform. I can have important team informational information, a safety notice, relevant information that provides a notification. If you haven't been out on IFS Insider, there is a video on how to build notifications in mobile, but we'll also go into that in a future webinar. So once I understand my important information, let's just go back and look at my other tiles. And these tiles can be changed for what makes the most sense for you and your organization. If you are doing in-transit shipments, which means I ship something from my warehouse and it shows in transit until somebody acknowledges it arrives at its destination, you can use receiving for on the mobile device. So I'm sending something from my warehouse that's high value to the technician, I want him to acknowledge that he, yep, I got that before he goes out for the day so that if he doesn't receive it, I can track down the shipment. If you're doing direct transfers, the moment you say that you moved it out of the warehouse, it will appear in your technician's inventory, which is your next button. Your technician's inventory here, I have this tax set up, Bob Bravo, to show all of the parts on their particular service truck. I think Bob runs truck one. I can get a description. I see the stocking location. Um, I see any additional information that I have about my part. So here I have my 17 inch flat panel display. I see my serial numbers that I should have on my truck. I see my part ID. I see they're usable. And I see a description of what that part is. If your tech's looking for a certain part, do I have any cable? I can key in a value and it will shorten the list to how many I have. You'll see this one says no, because this is a non-serialized part. So it doesn't display any serial number. All of the information we're looking at in these tiles are available in a disconnected state. 
So what happens if your tech's on site and wants to reach out and talk to somebody else on their team? The Teams tile shows you where all your other team members are. And if you click on any of the teams, you get an email, a phone number, a mobile phone number, and a Skype ID. Now, it goes without saying that you have to be in a connected state to use Skype or to make a phone call. If you don't have any connectivity, um, it's not going to work unless you're using data. And then I see my customers associated to my technician. So I've built a sync rule that has identified which customers out of all of my customers are relevant to this technician. And we've made a decision that 217 of them are important for this customer. This gives them the ability to check on information and find information, even if it's not active on an active call. So let me look for my AeroCorps. And here I have all of my AeroCorps and what's going on with them. And I'm going to take this one, Aero 100, and I'll see information about the customer, their time zone, some general information. I'll see the equipment that they have on their site. I see the contacts if I need to reach out to somebody on the site. I see the service history. Now, let's talk about service history. Is anybody going to actually read through 198 records? I probably want my set sync rule to say, <coughs> excuse me, that um, I want the last 10 records. I want the last 15 records. Nobody's going to read 198 records worth of history. And last but not least, I see my active work orders. So let's go into my work order screen. And I see I have a series of work orders. I have a sliver that gives me um, a priority on them. And let's go in and let's look at <coughs> our job we're currently on site with. Here I see AeroCorp. If I click on AeroCorp, I'll go back to that more information button that we had on place. If I'm in a connected state, I can get turn by turn directions to help me navigate to the location and it explains exactly where it's at. I see what request it's associated to. I see my contact when I arrive. I get their phone number, I get product information, I can look at more information about that product. It's under warranty. Here's my last service history. I see the parts that have been used and when they were used to repair it. <coughs> Excuse me. So I get all of this information about the hard drive that I'm doing service on. If it was under service contract, I would see the service contract. And if it was under warranty, I would see the warranty information. Now you'll note up here, you see a paper clip and a notation note indicator. In this case, I've sent down to my technician a product manual so that they can get information about the product <coughs> and in this case, I just downloaded the FSM service product manual, but you could send product manuals, guides, schematics, general information to give your technician as much help as possible in resolving the issue. And in this case, 
I have also sent down a note. And so I've entered a note that says the diagnostic test failed with errors. We need to dispatch a technician on site. So the tech knows that somebody in the back office has already tried to reach out to the machine and run some basic diagnostics and they failed. Helping them have more information about doing their job. This last button up here is called task status. In the smart client, you can identify what is called a task status flow. When you build those, you wanna think about what are your logical choices in your organization? If you assign a job to a technician in your world, what are their choices? In some organization, the first decision the tech has to make is are they gonna accept that job or reject that job? In this case, in my world, I've said my technician is either going to go in route on the way to the job, reject the job, or complete the job. And in this case, I'm going to go in route. What's happened back in the application now is I've stamped an in route event on the request. And for reporting purposes, I'll know that my tech has gone in route. Once I'm done going in route. I can go arrived in process or reschedule. What happens if something happens where somebody calls in, there's something more important. You could reschedule it. In this case, I'm going to say I arrived on site and then I'm going to go in process. If you don't like these statuses, you can build your own task status flows in the, in the smart client application or the web client. But when you build them, think about what are the choices that make sense from the state you're in. So at any point in the process, I can jump to any screen that I want to, but in this case, I've built what I think is a logical workflow for my technician so that all they have to do is go through and hit next. The first thing it's gonna tell me is my steps that I've built in the system for things that the technician is supposed to do. I see that it's required that they turn off the machine and wipe, wipe down the stitches, switches. And I see that I need to repair the machine based on the error code. You would of course have more relevant task steps for your technician. So I'm going to do both of my required steps. And now for reporting purposes, I can say, I perform these steps, who perform these steps, and what date and time those steps were performed. Next, I've decided in my process flow that my next logical thing to do is to use parts. So I'm going to say that I'm going to use a part and I can see all of the parts that are in my truck. And from my truck, um, we can use, let's use a battery. You'll notice now when I choose to do a battery that it's saying, hey, I, you need to dispose of it. Many municipalities and states require and countries that batteries be disposed of safely. So we've built a disposition rule that says, um, hey, what happened to the battery and what battery did you pull out and so now when i sync with the device i'm going to have in my unusable stock i'm going to show an unused part let's use one of our cables just so you Thought I had a cable in here, but maybe not. Okay, let's use doo, doo, doo. let's use a filter. We'll use one filter. It's not serialized. Now I'll have 98. Once I've added my parts, I could have miscellaneous parts. Miscellaneous parts are used by FSM for parts that you don't keep in stock. I had to go to the um, Home Depot and buy something. So I want to record the cost and the price. I also have the ability, if I'm in a connected state, 
Did you find parts near me where you can identify who has parts close to me based on where I'm at? So who has a blower motor within a 25 mile range of me? And because I'm sitting at home, it's I've got my location blocked that it didn't work, but you have the concept of how that would go through. I can record my labor. So how much time did I spend doing this? So I'm gonna say I spent two and a half hours doing this. I could have miscellaneous expenses. So I have lunch. Um, and so I'm gonna add that as my miscellaneous expense. I see my attachment. I could take additional pictures. I could record a video. I could attach other reports or documents. The thing that is relevant to understand about attachments is they are device centric. So if you're using a laptop that doesn't have a camera or doesn't give you video capability, you're not going to be able to take videos. So when you look at your mobile selection and your device selection, understand what feature set you're going to use and then um, go forward from there. Many customers have their customer review the work so that there are fewer questions on the invoice when it arrives. So my customer that I'm visiting with at AeroCorp is gonna sign off and say, yep, my machine is fixed, Bob Bravo fixed it. I understand that, you know, my labor rate was $212.50 an hour. He used $125 with the parts. My total invoice is gonna be $352.50. And so Mike is gonna sign off. My screen is a touch screen. So again, it's a device capability thing. If your screen doesn't have sort, um, support touch screen, you can't capture a signature. I'm also having Bob Bravo sign to confirm the work is entered accurately because I've chosen to do time reporting in the system. So I'm saying, Bob, say, yep, this is when you arrived and this is the work you did. So Bob is gonna sign off on the work. And I am going to say, yep. Now from here, I can either say my labor is finished or complete it on the status, or I can come down here at the bottom because I'm through my whole workflow and complete the request. Are you sure you wish to complete this job? And the information has gone up to the host and the request and task have come off my list of work to be done. Couple other notes about mobile while we're here. We, these are our tiles we saw, work orders, customers, inventory, and team. My technician has the ability to say they're on shift in a meeting, off shift, they can take a break via their work status. Um, that information, if they're in a connected state, will come back to the schedule board. You can do barcode scanning and receiving. For those of you that are doing 100% time reporting for your technician, you can record non-productive time on the system. So say, for example, I know that Friday I'm taking a vacation day. I can add vacation time. You could set up approvals on the um, back office. Just, you know, so you could allow your technicians to request time. They can record their time, sick, vacation, meetings, training, that are not associated to a particular request. And now Bob Bravo sees that he's entered time on the 26th, 27th, and 29th, but oops, he didn't enter any time on Friday or on Monday. So he probably needs to go back and do that or he's not gonna have a complete week. So I see full report, partial report, no report. So I know when I've added time. Calendar exceptions, you may have a corporate holiday and that would be visible on the screen also. So 
So this has given you a general introduction to mobile. Um, there was, you know, one other thing that we talked about um, when we talked about the sync interval um, and what is that frequency minus set for a minute. I can initialize the device. My technician can change their password. So we talked a little bit about that kind of information. We'll look at this more when we look at using mobile designer. Your designer choices here, where you see designer and screen only show up um, when you have an associated studio type license. The reason we did this is we felt that it was easier for the user to design the screen in the device being used. So once you make your device selection, whoever's gonna build the workflows and layouts um, have a studio license associated to them and then they can build the layouts and the workflows in the device your technicians are using. Technicians can have different designs. So if your install group needs a different set of screens than your break fix group, than your PM group, those can all have different sets of designs. So this gives you a general walkthrough on mobile. So at this point, I'm going to unmute you all and see if anybody has any questions. So let's go over to the audience and unmute all. Does anybody have any questions today? Hi, this is Piers Patrick. Uh, I work for Kyocera Europe. I have Hello. Two, I have two questions for you. Uh, we actually already have the system live uh, and we are trying to optimize. Mm -hmm. There's two things that I would like to ask. The first thing is, is there a way to get the other mobile to have the user stay logged in for longer than a couple of minutes? Or does every time you go switch to a different application, you always have to re-log in to the application? Um, let me get you an answer on that. What platform are you running? iOS and Android. iOS and Android. I thought with background sync that you no longer had to do, it could run in the background and you could go to other applications, but because you're asking me that question, I'm skeptical of what I've read. So let me <laughs> confirm that answer and get that back to you. And then my second question, I did not, maybe I missed it. I did not see, or I would like to know, where do you add what the technician did? So if the technicians, for example, said uh, they were at the customer and they fixed this, this, and this, like uh, further information of what they've done. Um, you could add to your workflow notes. Is, I mean, so is that where you want them? So in your workflow, notes go down to mobile and come back and forth. So they could have added like a fixed note and that fixed note you could choose to put on the invoice if you wanted to, to say, here's what your technician did. So just to add your note to your workflow. Okay, and then would it be possible, sorry, my third question, would it be possible to add this note into the customer summary? So that's maybe a tricky question. Uh, Possible, yes. Would I recommend doing it? Uh, I don't think you can do it with a client script, so I think it has to be a customization, and I'm very anti-customizations, but yes. I'll look that one up too. Yeah. We unfortunately have a lot of customizations, and it causes a lot of problems. Hence my recommendation that you really think about that cost-benefit value. Exactly. Because, yep. for example, iOS 15 comes out in June and you, you're running Android 2 and Android 11 is coming out. And as new devices come out, you're going to be forced into an uplift. So, exactly. yeah. Perfect. Thank you.
Certainly. I will get back to you on um, iOS and Android being able to run in the background, not requiring the logouts, and um, the ability to add notes to the customer summary. Wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything that you're looking for more information on? If not, I really appreciate you guys joining me today. And um, I hope that you have a good week and I hope to see you on future webinars. Have a nice week, take care. Thank you, bye. Thanks, bye.